them flying, keep them in the sky, keep them flying, hitting hard and high on every lip. The fervent cry, keep them flying, Uncle Sam. December 7th, 1941, a day that would live in infamy. In one masterful stroke, the U.S. Pacific Fleet was neutralized, opening the way for Japan to pursue its imperial ambitions in the Pacific. Japan's territorial ambitions had been growing for more than a decade. In 1931, Japan had stunned the world by invading Manchuria. In 1940, Japan invaded French Indochina. The United States had watched this process of imperial expansion with alarm. In 1941, President Roosevelt moved the Pacific Fleet from San Diego to Hawaii and ordered a military buildup in the Philippines, hoping to discourage further Japanese aggression. The Japanese were not deterred. Instead, they decided to attack. Within hours of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese also struck the Philippines, where General Douglas MacArthur was in command. U.S. troops, and the Air Forces in particular, were poorly prepared. Pilots and mechanics lacked adequate training, and aircraft had no spare parts. There was virtually no air raid warning network. The consequences were devastating. Within hours, half of the Far Eastern Air Force was destroyed. MacArthur was furious at how poorly his Air Force had performed. There was never a time in the Philippines when I gave the Air Force a mission that was carried out successfully. President Roosevelt ordered MacArthur to retreat to Australia, where he continued to lead the war effort in the South Pacific. He famously vowed to return to the Philippines. The Japanese continued their advance across the Pacific. Within a month of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese landed in the Dutch East Indies. The Allies suffered one defeat after another. Java, Sumatra, Timor, Bali, Malaya, Singapore. These were dark months for the Allies the Japanese advance seemed unstoppable. It was in these dire circumstances that B-Liner history began. The 21st Transport Squadron was activated on 5 April 1942 at Archer Field in Brisbane, Australia. Its first officers had been evacuated out of the Philippines during the Japanese attack. Some had also flown missions assisting with the evacuation of Java and the Dutch East Indies. These early B-liners flew whatever aircraft they could find. During the evacuation of Java, they purchased civilian airliners and worked alongside Dutch airline pilots. Later, they flew these aircraft to Australia. When the 21st formally stood up, it was given two C-39 transports formerly belonging to the Royal Dutch Airlines, one Lockheed Lodestar, a Lockheed Judson, a B-18, and a British de Havilland twin-engine biplane. At one point, the unit's 25 aircraft included 18 different types. In May, the first enlisted men joined the 21st as maintainers. They were drawn from various outfits, some as far away as Sydney. They had no formal orders, merely handshake agreements between commanders. For months, this undermanned group worked 17 to 18 hour days to keep the aircraft flying. The new transport squadron would have little time to get settled. Ten days after its founding, the 21st endured its first Japanese air raid. The 21st Historian from World War II. The Japanese dropped 24 daisy cutter anti personnel bombs. None of the crew were hurt. Several pieces of shrapnel pierced aircraft fuselage and rudders. Repairs were made from light canvas material and glued supplied by the Australian Army. Despite its haphazard beginnings, the 21st would be called upon almost immediately. Within a few weeks, it would be fully engaged in the war. In early 1942, General MacArthur received intelligence that the Japanese were planning to invade the town of Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, an island guarding the waters north of Australia. A successful invasion would cut off sea lanes between the U.S. and Australia. If Port Moresby fell, Australia itself would be in danger. In May 1942, Japan tried to take Port Moresby by sea. Australian and American naval and air forces drove them back in the Battle of the Coral Sea. <laughs> 
In July, the Japanese tried a daring new plan to take Port Moresby. They would land troops on the opposite side of the island and make a treacherous overland crossing through the Owen Stanley mountain range. The rugged terrain was only passable by a narrow footpath known as the Kokoda Trail. The Japanese struck New Guinea on July 21, 1942. They landed troops on the north coast and also raided Port Moresby by air. This attack was devastating for the 21st. The 21st transports had their aircraft lined up along the runway at Seven Mile Strip, Point Moresby. The Japanese attacked 26 bombers and 15 fighters making two runs down the runway, completely destroying one aircraft at the 21st and damaging many others. After this raid, the squadron commander and all the pots assisted the ground mechanics to prepare the aircraft. Many tires were damaged and several hydraulic systems had holes in the lines. Supplies were non-existent at this time and the line chief suggested to fill the airless tires with sand and to fill the dry hydraulic systems with coolant used by the fighters to give us the use of brakes. This air raid was only the first. By mid-August, the Japanese had raided the field 78 times. Back in 1939, as loyal subjects of the British Empire, the Australians had sent their best troops to fight in North Africa. Consequently, the defense of Papua New Guinea fell to Australia's other army, a poorly trained, poorly equipped militia. These were little more than kids, drawn from poor suburbs of Australia's largest cities. The main Australian army disparagingly called them chocolate soldiers. When things got hot, they would melt. When the Japanese landed in Papua New Guinea, these chocolate soldiers were all that stood between the invaders and Port Moresby. If Moresby fell, the entire South Pacific would be in danger. These young soldiers would need to fight the Japanese in some of the worst terrain in the world. Papua New Guinea was a land of jagged mountain peaks, swamps, and dense jungle. Days were hot and humid, and nights were freezing. The rain was torrential, and hordes of mosquitoes spread malaria and other diseases. The hostile terrain meant that logistical support was critical. The 21st Troop Carrier Squadron would be a lifeline for this ragged band of Australian soldiers as they made their stand against the Japanese. These missions were not easy. One problem facing the 21st was a lack of airfields. Airdrops were vital, but the 21st lacked parachutes. It would be two months before fresh parachutes began to arrive, so the 21st dropped much of their cargo without them. They learned to wrap food bundles in three layers of sacks to keep them from exploding on impact. The weather and terrain posed great danger to 21st crews. There was only one negotiable air pass through the peaks, a narrow, twisting gap between 5,000 and 7,000 feet. The high peaks were often hidden in clouds, and rain and mist would hang over the pass and trail. Typically, the weather in the morning would be clear, but during the day, large thunderstorms would build up over the mountains. Flying through the storms was out of the question. The wicked updrafts and downdrafts would literally break airplanes apart. The tops of the thunderstorms were often higher than the aircraft could fly, but pilots who tried to duck under the clouds risked running into a mountain peak. Airdrops were especially hazardous because it was impossible to hit the tiny mountainside DZs from high altitude. Many of the drop areas were on mountainsides or in valleys and had to be cleared by hand. One example of a treacherous area was the drop zone between the Orobaya Ridge and Kokoda. Aircraft had to fly over a 4,000 foot ridge and drop into a valley at 100 miles per hour, side slip from one side of the gorge to the other at treetop level, then climb out at 4,200 feet, all in a short distance. Another challenge facing 21st crews was the enemy. At Kokoda, pilots of the 21st Squadron were not always sure whether the landing strip was controlled by Allied forces or by the enemy. Several narrow escapes were reported by pilots, who upon coming in for landings sensed that something was wrong, and managed to take off despite enemy anti-aircraft and small arms fire. The terrain, weather, and enemy presence made these New Guinea missions exceptionally dangerous. In the month of August alone, four of Port Moresby's 32 aircraft were lost. One 21st crash is documented in some detail. Although it happened later in the war, it illustrates the pressures that 21st crews faced 
On June 21, 1945, a C-47 took off from Australia, carrying passengers and a load of fresh food. It landed in New Guinea in the evening, then took off again for the island of Biak. It was night, it was raining, and broken stratocumulus clouds reached up to 12,000 feet. Staff Sergeant William Ray Lieutenant Lair and I became very good friends. I also knew Ludwig and Waldrop and Wummer. That mission, they landed at Merak. It was raining. Since they were carrying a load of fresh food that would spoil if they spent the night, Lair felt obligated to make it back to Biek. After it took off, they were never heard from again. I was on one of the search missions, but we failed to find them. We searched the general area, but we saw nothing. It is so big and covered with mountains. It would be a miracle if they were found. In 1962, they were found. A hiker from New Zealand discovered the wreckage on a 12,000-foot mountain peak. The crew is now interred in Arlington National Cemetery. The fighting along the Kokoda Trail lasted for months. The 21st remained engaged, flying in supplies and eventually reinforcements. By the end of 1942, the beleaguered Australians had turned the tide in the Kokoda campaign. The Japanese were in full retreat. Fighting continued to rage elsewhere in New Guinea, and the 21st continued to deliver supplies and troops. The rugged terrain meant that airlift was vital to troop movements. Indeed, airlift gave the Allies a tremendous advantage over the Japanese, who were facing severe logistical problems. In early November, the Allies recaptured the airfield at Kokoda Village. This enabled the 21st to fly a new kind of mission, medevac. Previously, it had taken as many as 10 men to haul a single litter down the Kokoda Trail. Now air power could do the job. Between December of 1942 and January of 1943, the troop carriers evacuated an average of 280 sick and wounded soldiers each day. In January 1943, the Japanese recaptured a vital Allied airfield at Wanagela. This was one of the most treacherous fields in New Guinea. Australians had literally hacked it out of the jungle. The 3,000-foot runway had a 12% grade. 7,000-foot high mountains encircled the field from three sides. When the Japanese attacked, they outnumbered the Australian defenders by 5 to 1. They drove the Australians back to the very edge of the airfield. The 21st flew in desperately needed reinforcements and supplies. The air crews report the Japs have one end of the runway. The aircraft are returning with plenty of holes in the cowlings and rudders. The Australians have to run the Japs back to let the aircraft land. The troops sometimes leave the aircraft firing their Tommy guns. In the space of three days, the 21st and its sister squadrons hauled more than one million pounds of cargo to Wanagella. Three aircraft were lost. Thanks largely to this support from the 21st, the Australians held. Wanagella became a vital airbase, enabling further Allied offensives in the theater. The weather's fine for flying. The fog has gone to bed. There's such good visibility. You could see victory ahead. The 21st entered history once again in September 1943 when it participated in the Allied airborne assault at Nadzeb. This operation, the first airborne assault in the Pacific, would give the Allies control of a major new airbase, teach important lessons about airborne operations, and cause a major shift in Japanese strategic thinking. 302 aircraft from eight different airfields participated. Training for the operation was intense. The 5th Air Force, under which the 21st fell, practiced for three days straight. They went so far as conducting a full-scale trial run at an abandoned airstrip near Port Moresby. In the first wave of the assault, six squadrons of B-25 bombers softened up the drop zones. In the second wave, A-20s laid down massive smoke curtains. 96 C-47 troop carriers came next. Although no 21st pilots participated in the airdrops, the 21st contributed six aircraft. The C-47s dropped an entire regiment within four and a half minutes. A hundred fighter aircraft flew escort. The operation was a resounding success. C-47s from the 21st began landing at the newly occupied airfield within 24 hours, 
grass and brush around the airfield were still burning from the battle. Within five days, the 21st and its fellow squadrons flew in more than 420 plane loads of men and equipment from the 7th Australian Division. This division would go on to capture the key port at Lai, securing an Allied victory in Papua New Guinea. Almost two years earlier, during his evacuation from the Philippines, General MacArthur had chastised his Air Force for failing to execute any of its assigned missions. Now MacArthur's views changed. As he circled above Nadzab in a B-17, watching the operation unfold, he reportedly jumped up and down like an excited child. Gentlemen, that was as fine an example of discipline and training as I have ever witnessed. Nad Zeb had a deeper significance for the larger war effort. Back in Washington, senior military leaders had lost faith that airborne operations could work. Airborne assaults in Sicily had been spectacular failures. Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall convened a board to investigate why these airborne operations had failed. The board was in the middle of its investigation when, halfway across the world, Nad Zeb changed everything. Nadzab convinced Allied war planners that airborne operations could work. It gave them the confidence to go forward with airborne assault operations during Operation Overlord at Normandy. In early 1942, the Japanese had seemed unstoppable. They had won smashing victories at Pearl Harbor, in the Philippines, and elsewhere throughout the Pacific. At the time when the 21st Transport Squadron stood up, the situation seemed hopeless. The squadron's first members were refugees from those earlier defeats, flying jury-rigged, commandeered airliners. Within weeks of its founding, the squadron endured Japanese air raids and watched its aircraft destroyed on the ground. Yet the Allies showed remarkable tenacity, and by the end of 1943, momentum was on their side. A few months after the success at Nadzab, a brief entry in the 21st's records captured the new Allied spirit. March, 1944. This goddamn war in New Guinea is almost won. The Allies did win in New Guinea, and the island served as a springboard for further operations in the Pacific. By 1944, the Allies had isolated the Japanese stronghold at Rabaul. In late 1944, General MacArthur fulfilled his promise to return to the Philippines when he waded ashore at the island of Leyte. In 1945, the Allies landed at Luzon. In the long and arduous island-hopping campaign of the Pacific, New Guinea played an essential role. Victory in New Guinea contributed to the eventual Allied victory and Japanese surrender. The 21st Transport Squadron played a proud and distinguished role in this campaign. The hostile terrain of New Guinea and the long distances of the Pacific made this a war of logistics, a fact recognized by experts on New Guinea. Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff Colonel Fred H. Smith. The handling of ground troops and supply was the key to the Papuan victory. It was the transporting of the troops and supply that made our air power most useful. General Douglas MacArthur. No commendation could be too great. Transportation of men and equipment won the battle. This is how the 21st Airlift Squadron began. This is our proud heritage. At a time of grave peril, these men rose to their nation's call. They built the world's finest mobility air force literally out of nothing. Through hard work and creative genius, they kept their planes flying despite constant air raids. In the face of tremendous risks, they supplied and reinforced badly outnumbered Australian forces on the Kokoda Trail and at Wanagela. And when the Allies began to turn the tide, the 21st pioneered revolutionary new concepts for enveloping the enemy from the air, culminating in the airborne operation at Nadzeb. They accomplished these missions despite great personal risk, and for their courage, they paid a great price. Let us not forget their sacrifice. As we carry forward the legacy of the 21st Airlift Squadron, let us live and fly and fight with the same courage that they demonstrated. Let us be faithful to the proud heritage from which we sprang. Let us always remember. Here's to you. In the door.